Education. March 18, 1968. Soviet Defense Minister Marshal Andrei Grechko addresses his top generals. I have just returned from a Politburo meeting. It was decided that Warsaw Pact troops will enter Czechoslovakia. This decision will be made, even if it leads to a Third World War. Moscow, March 18th, 1968. August 21st, 1968, at night, 500,000 soldiers from the Warsaw Pact Army crossed the border into Czechoslovakia. This was the beginning of the occupation of the country. The armed forces of the Soviet Union, East Germany, Bulgaria, Hungary, and Poland took part in the military intervention. The invasion was provoked by democratic reforms conducted by the Czechoslovak government. Immediately after the intervention, the Kremlin issues a statement. It says that the troops were introduced to help the fraternal Czechoslovak people. Prague Spring. Who are the Russians for the Czechs? Brothers or friends? Of course, brothers. You may choose your friends, but not your brothers. This joke was popular in Czechoslovakia in late 1968. It accurately reflected the Czechs' feelings towards the Soviet occupation. The occupation was provoked by an attempt by Czechoslovakia to build socialism with a human face. Moscow quickly proved to Czechs and Slovaks that socialism cannot have a human face. In 1945, Czechoslovakia was liberated from Nazi occupation. But very soon it became the victim of a second occupation. Fascism was replaced by the Soviet system. In the spring of 1945, after the Nazi occupation in Czechoslovakia, a new national government was created. In this government, the Czechoslovak Communist Party was represented by seven ministers. Communists prepared the base of the government's action plan. The priority was boosting relations with Moscow. May 16, 1945. President Edward Benes returns to his homeland after spending the war in exile in London. Benes maintained a friendly relationship with the Soviet Union, but at the same time felt that this should not pose a danger to the country's sovereignty. May 26, 1946. The Communist Party of Czechoslovakia wins parliamentary elections. Stalinist Communist Party General Secretary Clement Gottwald heads the new government. Czechoslovak communists entrenched themselves in power. The secret police and the ministries of defense and internal affairs are subordinated to the communist party. Nineteen forty-eight, Czechoslovakia enters a political crisis. On February twentieth. 12 ministers demand President Benes resign. They were provoked by Interior Minister Vaclav Sok's move to dismiss all police officers who were disloyal to the communists. <laughs> 
February 21st. In support of the Communist Party of Czechoslovakia, Clement Gottwald brings workers to Prague's central square and arranges a meeting. The power structures that were completely controlled by the communists begin to create people's militia units and hand out guns. On the streets of the capital, there are armed men. The country had created the danger of civil war. In this situation, Venice accepts the resignation of the ministers and appoints replacements proposed by Gottwald. This amounted to a coup in Czechoslovakia. February 25th, Gottwald announces the beginning of a new communist era in the state. Next, Czechoslovakia begins political repressions. There are show trials. More than 200,000 people are imprisoned. These trials continue through the 1950s, when Antonín Novotný becomes the local Communist Party leader. Novotný is the Soviet leader Nikita Khrushchev's protégé. In 1960, the National Assembly adopts a new constitution on Novotny's initiative. The Czechoslovak Republic is renamed the Czechoslovak Socialist Republic. Obecně vlastně se ten komunistický režim dostával do situace, že in Eastern Europe, Czechoslovakia was considered one of the most conservative states. In the Soviet bloc, it quickly became one of the most liberal countries. To some extent, this was because of Antonín Novotny. After some time, Novotny became aware that the processes were out of control. He allowed himself too much. In 1967, Novotny tried to change the situation. This led to the opposite result. Novotny was forced to resign. As a result of Novotny's actions, the social economic situation had deteriorated dramatically. This led to social discontent. In 1967, student demonstrations began in Prague. There were protests among the party ranks itself. In October 1967, Prague hosted a plenum of the Czechoslovak Communist Party. At the meeting, members of the Central Committee accused Antonín Novotny of ignoring a pluralistic style of leadership and urging him to resign as president or first secretary. The opposition against Novotny was formed in 1967. It was a very heterogeneous formation. There were Slovaks and the Czechs together supporting reform. Their political aims were different. We can say that they shared only a desire to depose Novotny. The views of the opposition on what would happen after his resignation and in what direction the state should develop were not the same. Novotny had to give in to these demands. On January 4, 1968, the Central Committee plenum elects Alexander Dubček in Novotny's place. 47 years old, Dubček had been the first secretary of the Communist Party of Slovakia. This choice satisfied the Soviet leadership. In the 50s, Dubček studied in Moscow at the Higher Party School and spoke fluent Russian. Dubček. Dubček led the Communist Party of Slovakia at the time. He was considered as one of the most prominent figures in the opposition. Dubček was acceptable to all. 
Moscow was pleased with his election. His parents moved to live in the Soviet Union when he was a child. At first, his family lived in Kyrgyzstan, and then they moved to Nizhny Novgorod. His father worked in the automobile factory. Of course, Dubček knew Russian very well. In total, he spent 16 years in Russia. Despite the fact that Dubček had good relations with Moscow, he began to pursue a policy independent from the Soviet Union. A few weeks after his appointment, the new leader of the Communist Party began to take decisions the Kremlin did not expect. Dubček cleaned Stalin-era officials from the state ministries and replaced them with young party members. In February 1968, Dubček gave a speech at the Congress of the Agricultural Cooperatives. He stated the need to democratize socialism in Czechoslovakia and regroup all of the country's social forces. The first important step in this direction was made on the 3rd of March, when the government abolished censorship. The most important change during this Prague Spring was the abolition of censorship. During the Dubček period, the press had great freedom. Journalists and citizens used the press to make suggestions and demands outside of Dubček's own Communist Party action plan. When Dubček was chosen as the first secretary of the Communist Party of Czechoslovakia in January 1968, the people took it as a normal change. No one paid any attention. But in March, two months after the appointment, people realized that there were real changes and the Communist Party was doing things that were impossible to imagine before. The most notable change occurred in February 1968. Behind the scenes, censorship was abolished. In June, this was made official. The press, radio, television had the opportunity to provide real information about what was going on. It became possible to talk openly about Edward Benes, Czechoslovakia's first president, Masaryk, and most importantly, they didn't have to follow the communist line on these topics. Dubček did not advocate dismantling the Soviet system. Czechoslovak foreign policy was without questions. He considered himself a Marxist and believed the only way to restore the legitimacy of socialism was by correcting the mistakes made by Stalin and his followers. Such a policy at that time was sufficient to make Dubček immensely popular in the country. In principle, it was about humanizing the communist regime. For this, communist ideology had to be humanized and bring it closer to the masses. The government had to recognize the mistakes the communist regime had made during the repressions in the 1950s. It became the ideological basis of these reforms. Of course, these were not only ideological, but practical issues. For example, the reform started with the economy. The situation in Czechoslovakia was changing rapidly. On March 23, 1968, Novotny resigned from his post as president under public pressure. The National Assembly elected a new president of Czechoslovakia, popular hero General Ludwig Svoboda. The changes were finalized at the party plenum in Prague on March 28. The Communist Party of Czechoslovakia makes a new policy document at this time.
April 5, 1968. The country's main newspaper publishes a program of radical reforms in the country developed by the Central Committee of the Communist Party of Czechoslovakia. The program was prepared by its leader, Alexander Dubček, and his team. Dubček's reconstruction plan did not contain anything anti-socialist. He simply recalled for reforming the existing system. For example, the program abolished censorship and guaranteed freedom of speech and assembly. Citizens could travel abroad freely. The program involved economic reforms. State-owned enterprises were given economic freedom. With these reforms, Dubček wanted to give the socialist system a human face. Czechoslovakia simplified its border crossing regime. Citizens were given the right to freely travel abroad. Different types of social organizations were created that were not controlled by the communists. The radical management changes were supported by the local communist party itself. Some members of the party demanded the introduction of a multi-party system. At the legislative level, Censorship was not abolished, but the media openly criticized the Soviet system and talked about its shortcomings. This program fixed basic civil rights, in particular, freedom of the press, speech, assembly, and conscience. But no changes were anticipated for the political system. Nothing was said about multi-party systems, competition between the parties, or pluralism. The communists found it possible that only such public organizations such as trade unions, the women's union, and the like could exist. These organizations had the right to criticize the government. So the purpose of these changes was not a democratization of the country. The Soviet government anxiously watched the changes in Czechoslovakia. All leaders of the Warsaw Pact members expressed their dissatisfaction directly to Dubček. The Kremlin was considering several options to change the situation in Czechoslovakia, including a military intervention. On May 4, 1968, General Secretary Leonid Brezhnev and Alexander Dubček meet in Moscow. Brezhnev criticizes the liberalization policy. The Kremlin is particularly irritated by the fact that influence of the Communist Party of Czechoslovakia was weakening and there were anti-Soviet attacks in the press. Dubček recognized the anti-Soviet sentiment. However, he was confident that the reforms initiated by him in Czechoslovakia did not threaten socialism. The Czechoslovak government in 1968 was deluded. They tried to explain to the leadership of the Soviet Union that they had good ideas and reforms that would just change the face of communism in the country. They said that communism would become more attractive, but the system itself wouldn't be threatened. It was a naive position. In any case, the recovery has become a very important and significant event. The development of this process was a surprise to most leaders. They did not expect such support from the population. They even felt some confusion. People pushed the government to steps that were beyond the scope of the program. Dubček was confused. He tossed from side to side. He had to prove to Brezhnev that there was nothing anti-communist happening in Czechoslovakia. At the same time, the public told a different story. Dubček knew that the people wanted to continue the reforms. Citizens wanted Dubček's motto, socialism with a human face, to be more than just a slogan. They sought democracy and freedom. <laughs> 
The Soviet Union did not give them this opportunity. Dubček's program began to take shape a few months later. On June 26, 1968, the Federal Assembly of Czechoslovakia officially abolishes censorship. The next day, the newspaper ran free editions. Among them was a manifesto, 2,000 words. It was simultaneously published in several papers. The author of the manifesto was writer Ludwig Vasilik. The document was signed by 70 Czech and Slovak intellectuals. The manifesto criticized the post-war communist government and supported Dubček's reforms. The manifesto explicitly stated that the conservative wing of the Communist Party of Czechoslovakia, which resisted reform, was supported by Moscow. Those who signed the manifesto did not rule out that the Soviet Union would militarily intervene to stop the reforms. July 3rd. CPSU Central Committee sends a letter to the leadership of the Communist Party of Czechoslovakia. The Kremlin demands Czech communists take decisive actions and stop the activities of anti-socialist forces. Most of all, Moscow is irritated by the publication of Vasilik's manifesto. The Soviet government begins a massive propaganda effort. State newspaper Pravda almost daily publishes letters from collective workers in the labor classes of Czechoslovakia to Dubček. The Kremlin's campaign was followed by Warsaw Pact member states. Later, Moscow involved communist organizations in Mongolia and Latin America. On July 19, 1968, Brezhnev wanted to meet Dubček again and discuss the situation. The talks were held in the border town of Cherna nad Tisu. It was held in a tense atmosphere. The Kremlin gave a number of ultimatums to Dubček. Ta schůzka v Černé nad Tisou trvala několik dní a její základní problém spočívá v tom, This meeting at Cherna nad Tisu lasted several days. The main problem was that Brezhnev and Dubček interpreted the results of the negotiations both in their favor. The Soviet side put a few basic requirements, restoring censorship in the media, minimizing the reforms, and the resignation of the government of Czechoslovakia, who were associated with these reforms. The Soviets believed that Czechoslovakia would fulfill these requirements after the meeting, but Dubček interpreted the meeting differently. He thought that in the end, he had not given Brezhnev any unconditional guarantees. August 3rd. Bratislava hosts a meeting of leaders from the Soviet Union and five Eastern European countries. It was a demonstration of unity and the inviability of the Soviet bloc. Poland, the German Democratic Republic, Bulgaria, Hungary, and the Soviet Union issue a joint statement. It says that the defense of socialism is the duty of all socialist countries. The statement is addressed to all states of the socialist camp, but first and foremost, it is a warning to Czechoslovakia. The Soviet leadership demands Dubček fulfill these obligations. On this occasion, Brezhnev has a phone conversation with the head of the Czechoslovak Communist Party. Dubček defends himself and explains to Brezhnev that implementing the decisions takes time. In fact, he was buying time. Dubček was preparing for the 14th Party Congress. It would have to approve the democratic changes. The leadership of the Soviet Union gradually became convinced that Dubček was not going to fulfill their demands. Takže když vlastně Brezhnev ještě telefonicky 
Brezhnev called Dubček several times. He demanded the agreements be implemented. Dubček replied this required appropriate training and time. The last conversation between Brezhnev and Dubček was decisive. He told Dubček that after their meeting two weeks had passed, but the situation had not changed. Brezhnev asked, Sasha, what are you going to do? What are you thinking? Dubček reacted angrily. Brezhnev then said that he would be forced to take other actions. He hinted that if the demands were not met, the country would be threatened with occupation. At this, Dubček indignantly replied, do what you want to do. Perhaps he simply felt that an occupation was inevitable at that point. In this case, the dilemma facing him would have resolved itself. Moscow decides to invade militarily to stop the reforms in Czechoslovakia. On August 20th, at 10.15 p.m., Soviet divisions deploy to the border and receive the order to move. The military operation, codenamed Danube, has begun. Soviet paratroopers seize the Ruzin airport near Prague. To occupy Czechoslovakia, 26 divisions and 5,000 tanks from five Warsaw Pact countries take part. Rozhodnutí provést intervenci leželo samozřejmě plně na Sovětském svazu, který samozřejmě. Of course, the Soviet Union initiated the intervention. East Germany, Poland, Hungary, and Bulgaria also joined. But the whole occupation process was coordinated by Moscow. The occupation began August 20th. More than half a million soldiers were sent into Czechoslovakia. Of course, most were Soviet soldiers. The military forces of the countries had a symbolic meaning. The scenario was the same as in Hungary in 1956. A new government had to be named in Czechoslovakia. Then the government would request the Soviet troops. In this case, the occupation would be considered legitimate. At 2 a.m., Prague Radio broadcasts that troops are invading the country. The Czechoslovak government orders its troops to remain in their barracks. The population is urged to stay calm. Despite this, the people take to the streets at night. Spontaneous demonstrations against the invaders begin. Dubček and his associates are the paratroopers' main objective. At dawn, Soviet troops surround the building of the Central Committee of the Communist Party of Czechoslovakia, where Dubček was holed up. Demonstrators gather there and try to resist. In response, the Soviet soldiers open fire. Dubček and several officers are arrested in the building of the Central Committee. On the same day, they are flown to the Soviet Union. August 21st, the occupying forces take control of the Parliament, Ministry of Defense, and General Staff the Ministry of Internal Affairs, Central Television, several publishing houses, and the Presidential Palace. In 1968, when television was not yet widespread, radio was the leader of communications. Because of this, the main task for the Soviet troops who rolled into Prague was to take the radio station building. Anti-Soviet calls were spread through the radio. We are with you. Be with us too. Soviet soldiers began storming the station August 21st. At 8 a.m., Soviet tanks were on the street called Vinohradska. 
This street was dug up on both sides. Hundreds of unarmed people defended the radio station building. 22 people were killed in the assault. Soviet soldiers were able to seize the building, but it continued to broadcast live. The military could not find the small studio broadcasting the show. From the occupied building, the word freedom rang out. V podstatě došlo došlo ke střetu obyvatel, kteří demonstrovali v okolí rozhlasu. In front of the station, paratroopers clashed with the crowd. It was about 85 soldiers. In addition to the Soviet military, there were army units from East Germany. They tried to enter the building and turn off the live broadcast. When the demonstrators blocked their way, the military first threatened to use force to persuade them to disperse. When they realized that this method would achieve nothing, they began to shoot in the air. There were several incidents that resulted in human casualties. There was a rumor that the Soviets would try to take the station. Because of this, people began to gather there. They erected barricades with cars and trams, which they defended with their own lives. During the clashes, several dozen people were killed. A few hours later, the Soviet military was able to seize the building. But the live broadcast continued to transmit. The live program continued from an auxiliary broadcasting studio. In principle, this was a major defeat for the Soviet troops. On August 21st, 12 underground radio stations began operating in Czechoslovakia. They broadcast events and called on the invaders in their native language not to take part in the aggression. Spontaneous peaceful resistance spread throughout the country. The people of Prague gathered in the central square not hiding their disdain for the invaders. Citizens blocked streets with trucks and prevented heavy vehicles from moving. There were anti-Soviet slogans and Nazi symbols on the tanks. In general, we can say that the population provided passive resistance to the invaders. People threw stones and pieces of asphalt at the soldiers, wrote various slogans, posted posters. In Czechoslovakia, many spoke Russian. They tried to explain to the Soviet soldiers that they were deceived and had been led against an unarmed population. On the streets of Prague, spontaneous clashes erupted between soldiers and protesters. The soldiers fired at unarmed demonstrators. On the first day of the intervention in Prague, Liberec and Kasice, the occupants killed and injured more than 2,200 civilians. A curfew was declared in Prague. 36 hours after the invasion, Warsaw Pact troops took full control of Czechoslovakia. Soviet soldiers invaded smaller towns. I remember very well the events of the Prague Spring. I was already very active in civil society. I immediately joined the peace movement against the occupation. 
At that time, I was in the city of Liberec. During the week, I participated in the national resistance. This phenomenon itself is interesting from the point of view of sociology and political science. We had a lot of illusions. To a large extent, it can be said about the reformers who were in the government. At the same time, the Communist Party was headed by a pro-reform faction, intelligent, free-thinking people. We can say that they had wide support. But despite this, the international situation was not in our favor. As opposed, for example, to the situation in 1989. It was clear that the West could not help us in any situation. The Soviet Union conducted a successful operation to occupy Czechoslovakia. However, it suffered a complete collapse in political and moral support. Even the Czechoslovak communists disapproved of Moscow's actions. August 22nd, the Czechoslovak Communist Party holds an underground plenum condemning the actions of the Soviet Union. The situation needed to be settled. Negotiations begin between the Kremlin and Prague. August 23rd, Czechoslovak President Ludvík Svoboda arrives in Moscow. He persuades the Kremlin to release Dubček and involve him in the negotiation process. Three days later, the Czechoslovak delegation signs a protocol under which the country will reintroduce censorship. The opposition will be banned, and the reformers would be relieved of their positions by the Central Committee. The occupation troops would remain as long as socialism was under threat. Our leadership was forced to sign the agreement. Of course it was not good, but they were able to get some concessions from Moscow. For example, they managed to make it so that the events in Czechoslovakia were not appreciated as a counter-revolution. In its assessments, nothing was said about the protests in the West, and so on. Alexander Dubček returned home on August 26th. The next day, he appealed to the public. Czechoslovakia will continue on the path of socialism. Ignoring reality means that we have to deal with adventurism and anarchy. He did not mention the document signed in Moscow. However, Further developments showed one thing, the Prague Spring was over. If Soviet troops didn't enter Czechoslovakia, the people would have been able to significantly limit the influence of the Communist Party. It would not be the sole and leading force in the country. In Czechoslovakia, there would have been other political changes that the Soviet Union could not stop. Other socialist countries could have followed Czechoslovakia's example. In this case, Moscow would find it difficult to maintain the communist regime in Eastern Europe. After the intervention in August and September, 108 people were killed in Czechoslovakia. More than 500 were injured. 98 Soviet soldiers were killed, most through careless handling of weapons, plane crashes, and car accidents. In September, the Czechoslovak government started to implement the commitments it undertook in Moscow. Otkhitsinarndegi, atma tavishe ekavada, oras otstarva momkhred. 
4 against 10, and 228 abstentions. The Federal Assembly of Czechoslovakia held this vote October 18, 1968, here in this building. Only one issue was discussed at the meeting, the deployment of Soviet forces in Czechoslovakia. Everyone understood that the presence of Soviet troops in the country would be legalized. Two days earlier, on October 16th, the Soviet delegation arrived in Prague that had issued the agreement on Soviet military bases. Under this agreement, the Soviet army would temporarily stay until the stabilization of the situation. As it turned out, the temporary presence of Soviet troops in Czechoslovakia lasted 23 years. The Soviet Union placed five divisions in the territory of Czechoslovakia, which included 70,000 to 85,000 soldiers. The headquarters of the central group of forces was 38 kilometers from Prague in the town of Milovice. After 1945, Soviet troops had returned to Czechoslovakia. In autumn 1968, conservative forces intensify attacks on the reformers. Gustav Husak, the first secretary of the Communist Party in the Slovak Republic before the Soviet invasion, was a supporter of Dubček. However, after negotiations that took place in Moscow, he changed his position. On November 14th, at the request of Gustav Husak, the plenum of the Central Committee adopts a resolution condemning liberal opportunism in the party. In October and November, Massive student demonstrations sweep several cities in Czechoslovakia. Young people demand freedom of speech and wanted the government to continue reforms. On November 7th, in Prague, Bratislava and Brno, Soviet flags are burned. The police disperse students with batons and water cannons. On this day, 176 people were arrested across Czechoslovakia. The population was so upset with the turn of events that several people committed suicide. January 16th, 1969, in Prague, Vensela Square. Near the National Museum, a young man appeared at about 4 p.m. He took off his coat. Then, he doused himself with gasoline from a bottle brought with him, and lit a match. The fire quickly swept the young man. Overcome by fire, he ran towards the National Museum, but after a few steps, he fell down and began rolling on the asphalt. Passerbys managed to knock down the flames. This young man was Jan Palach. A few days later, he died in a hospital from his burns. In a letter left by Palac, it appeared that he had committed self-immolation to protest the Soviet invasion of Czechoslovakia in 1968. Before his death, not far from the museum, he had left a folder with a letter. In this letter, he explained why he had decided to burn himself. There were also demands. I remember one of them. Abolish censorship in Czechoslovakia. If the power for five days failed to comply with these requirements, Jan urged people to go on an indefinite strike. January 25th. Palach's funeral turns into a mass demonstration. On the streets of Prague, about 100,000 people turn out. Jan Palach became a symbol of the struggle against the Soviet Union. <laughs> 
Very soon, there were copycats of Palach. A month later, on February 25th, 18-year-old Jan Zeitz self-immolates and dies on Wenceslas Square. From January to April 1969, there were 25 self-immolations. Of these, seven died. In April 1969, Alexander Dubček resigns from his post as head of the Communist Party. The Gustav Husak period had begun in the country, and it would last 20 years. After the events of 1968, tens of thousands of people left Czechoslovakia. Most of the emigrants were intellectuals, almost 30,000 people. After the Prague Spring, popular Czech director Milos Forman also emigrated. The communist regime restricted and oppressed the rest of the country. Open-minded people who openly protested and refused to submit to the Soviet system were fired from their jobs and persecuted. Future Czech President Václav Havel was arrested several times. Well-known writer Milan Kundera was stripped of his citizenship and expelled from the country for his anti-Soviet works. Communist society expelled and left without livelihood those who did not want to think like everyone else. First of all, we should admit, and I have said this before, that the fall of the Soviet Union was the greatest geopolitical catastrophe of the century.